people of good and everybody's worthy of our love and our service. But I was not awake about justice and the issues of poor people, which was rampant in Louisiana, my state. And I grew up in privilege, and the awakening came that to really follow the radical Jesus, the Jesus who was among the people who were the marginated and the despised, I needed to serve poor people who had served me growing up. African-American people in the days of segregation when I grew up in Louisiana. The only African-American people I ever met were our servants. Ellen worked in the house and her husband Jesse worked in the yard. I didn't even know their last names. And they like called me Miss Ellen. But then that awakening to the gospel, which means it's more than just charity and loving everybody around us, it was about justice. And there were injustices. And racism was an injustice. And in New Orleans, Louisiana, once I moved from the suburbs of New Orleans into the inner city and began to serve African American people struggling against racism and poverty, I began to understand the gospel in a whole different way. And it didn't take long to see that there was a grease track from being poor and African American in Louisiana State Prison. So working there at a place called Hope House, I got an invitation one day to write somebody on death row. I didn't even know they were going to kill him. I mean, we hadn't had an execution. There had been an unofficial moratorium on the death penalty for 20 years in the United States. We thought we were going to put the death penalty away forever. And I wrote this man on death row, and he wrote back, and I visited him. And two years later, I was in that execution chamber with him. And he looked at my face as he was killed in the electric chair. And, but there was also the victims. And at first I made a very bad mistake. In my book, Dead Man Walking, I'll take you through this journey of mine. And it included this bad mistake with the victim's family. Because here I am being spiritual advisor to this man on death row. Then when I found out about the crime that he and his brother had killed in cold blood, this innocent teenage couple, and then I realized what the crime was, and then I thought of the parents, because this is every parent's worst nightmare. Your kids go to a football game on a Friday night, and you never see them alive again. But the big mistake I made was I didn't reach out to them because I thought they would think I'm the spiritual advisor to, the, to one of the people who, was, who had killed their children, and I stayed away. So I didn't write them a note, I did nothing. And I met them at the pardon board hearing in Louisiana, the last step before a person's executed. And of course, they are there, because everybody was saying to the victim's family, the way we're going to get you justice, and the way we're going to honor your children, is to get death. Because they killed, so we're going to get death for them. And that's when I met them. And because there was no groundwork, because I hadn't reached out to them, how could they not see me as the enemy? Because why was I at the party board meeting? I was there to ask them not to execute this human being, to let him serve the rest of his life in prison. But when you get on that seesaw, and when everybody around you is saying to you, this is how we're going to honor your dead children. And then you have somebody say to you, oh, but I'm not for the death penalty. They're superhuman beings if they don't see you as some kind of betrayer or enemy. That was my experience. But then we're always surprised by grace. It can happen in any of us. John Breckenridge sitting over there, his story is a story of grace. My story is a story of grace. God wakes us up. And we wake up each other. We share with each other, we wake each other up, and that's what's happening about the death penalty in this. When I did meet these families, the girls' family was very angry, they refused to talk to me, and I didn't blame them, I'd done it all wrong. But the boys' father and mother, David, this young kid, 17, Lloyd LeBlanc came right up to me at that pardon board here, and he said, Sister Helen, all this time you've been visiting with those two with the two brothers that killed David. Sister, you never once came to see us. Sister, you can't believe the pressure we under for the death penalty. 
And I didn't know victims' families would be on any kind of pressure. He said, I'll pray in this little chapel. Sister, come pray with me. And if you see the film, that man walking, it's going to keep bringing you over to both sides of this issue. Here's the perpetrator, here are the people who have done the crime, it's unspeakable, we're outraged over what they did. Then, here's the family suffering, how could they ever get closure? How could they ever get healing? And through Lloyd LeBlanc, who was the first one to teach me, he reached the point in himself. He said, Sister, with all those people telling me, Lloyd, you got to be for the death penalty or it looked like you didn't love your son. He said, I went there. I did. I said, I wish I could pull the switch myself. I want to see them suffer for what they did. Look how my wife suffered, our family suffered. They killed David, our young David. He was only 17. He never got a chance to be an adult, to have a family. And all my anger and all my hatred, I said, let me at him, let me pull that switch. And then he saw what was happening to him. And then he said, I kept praying, Jesus, you got to help me. you got to help me. And he said, I just came to a point where I got it. And I just said, and he put his hand like this when he told me this. He said, no, they killed our son, but I'm not going to let him kill me. Because I'm going to be dead too if I let all this hatred and this anger take me over. And then he set his face to begin going down the road. He said, people think forgiveness is weak, like, oh, you killed my son, I'm forgiving you, like, it's okay, I condone it. He said, it's not weak. In a way, it's saving your own life, because I'd have been taken over by that. And that's in John's story to John Breckenridge. And what happened to me, purely and simply, is that I got to meet victims' families and began to go to victim support groups, and the big surprise I got in those groups was almost everybody in those victim support groups said, everybody stays away from us. They don't know what to say to us. They don't know how to talk to us about their pain, so they stay away. And so they need our support and help, people who've been victimized by crime. And then on the other side, we have the ones that we say, these are the worst of the worst. They do not deserve to live among us. And so we decide that there will be certain ones that we will put to, be put to death. And when you look at any system in any state that's trying to do the death penalty, you come to very human agents who have to apply it. And that's where it all breaks down. So you have one prosecutor and prosecutors have to be the discretionary ones that choose it. I'll go for the death penalty, the one right next door never does. Uh, here we have it, well, if you kill a police officer, you get the death penalty. But here was a case recently with this Richard Guy Brooks who hired somebody to kill his gardener, and it was flea bargained by the DA. That was premeditated. And he got off. Not off that he's free on the streets, there was no question of seeking the death penalty. All these factors enter in. And I have talked to jurors, just good people like us, ordinary people, asked to go behind closed doors. And now you decide if, if your fellow human being lives or dies. The burden they are asked to bear, to act in this godlike way, go choose now, make a decision. Look at the crime that he did. And then what it pushes us to, finally, is the dignity of our life, not just innocent life. And those of us who call ourselves pro-life, we need to be pro-life. We need to be pro-life wherever life is vulnerable and doesn't have a voice and can't protect itself, whether it's a person with Alzheimer's or whether it's a baby trying to be born. And that mother needs a voice, too. But not just the innocent, but the guilty. What about the guilty? And I'll end with this. Because this is all the stuff we're thinking about and reflecting on because New Hampshire's taking a look at this issue in a way it never has before. I had a chance to have a dialogue with Pope John Paul. It's in my second book, The Death of Innocence. And I said, Your Holiness, 
when I'm walking with a man to execution. He's shackled hand and foot. He's guilty of a terrible crime. I'm horrified at his crime. We all are. But here he is being accompanied by six guards to the execution chamber. And he says to me, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs. Where is the dignity in this death? When we make a human being defenseless, and then we take him out and we kill him. The death penalty is about us. People do terrible crimes. We need to protect ourselves from people who do violent crimes. They will pay for it with the rest of their lives, with a life parole sentence, and that's what's in the repeal bill. But it's about us. Maybe in some books of justice, people for what they do deserve to die, but do we deserve to kill them? What about us? It's about us as a society, and whether or not we can see dignity in life, even in the guilty, which is what human rights is about. It's not about governments giving human rights for people who do good behavior and taking them away when they have bad behavior. It's that foundation that life is given to us and, and God takes life. Who are we to put ourselves in that role? And when you look at the track records of the states doing the death penalty the most, like my state, Louisiana, like the deep south states that have always executed criminals, had a harsh penal system, Mistakes are happening all over the place. We now have 143 wrongfully convicted people who, by the grace of God and college students and innocence projects, were, were lucky enough to prove their innocence and get off a of death row. We are about to release a man in Louisiana, Glenn Ford, who has been on death row 30 years, and he's innocent. And it was a snitch, a jailhouse snitch that lied at trial, the prosecutor was going for it, have what we need. 30 years that man has been on death row. We make mistakes. We don't have to make mistakes about life and death. We can make mistakes about how we do our highways. We can make mistakes about all kinds of things. But not to hold in our hands life and death and to say we can be the arbiters of that. So I was asked to talk about the Catholic Church position and Completely with what our sister has said. I'll give you some background on this. Uh, I was asked to say, you know, why is the church involved in this? Why do we care? And the usual answer is if you look at the, uh, the Gospels, Jesus talks about the two big commandments love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And John's Gospel says that we should love one another as he has loved us. So we're involved in this because we're concerned with these kinds of issues in society. Uh, we're concerned about justice issues. Pope Benedict XVI said the church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. So we must be involved in this. And Pope John Paul II, in, almost 20 years ago now, in uh, Evangelium Vitae in 1995, said this. He said the death penalty is morally permissible only when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society. And today such cases are very rare if not practically non-existent. 20 years ago, uh, John Paul II. Now, in trying to determine the Catholic position on you know, what, what do we understand God's will to be in any given case, traditionally Catholics talk about scripture and tradition and the teaching office of the church. So I'd like to go quickly through each one of those and talk about how we get to John Paul's conclusion here. When you look at scripture, we talk about our interest in finding out what this has to tell us about good and evil, about sin and redemption, and about justice and mercy. And you find out if you look at the Old and New Testament that human beings, as Sister said, are created in the image and likeness of God. We talk about human dignity. It's nothing that you can earn, and it's nothing that you can lose. We talk about the dignity of the human person. Human person redeemed by Jesus Christ we learn in the New Testament. When you look at the Bible as a whole, you talk about progression. Catholic biblical scholarship doesn't just pick a verse out here or there. So we say, okay, what does Scripture tell us? And right after we're told we're made in the image and likeness of God, we run into the, the Cain-Abel story. The first murder. 
Cain kills his brother Abel. Well, how does God react? God prohibits retaliatory violence. Cain is not executed. Cain is banished. But God gives him a mark to protect him so that people will not kill him. And then we go, you know, five generations later and we run into Lamech. And he brags about killing people for bumping into him, for bruising him. Clearly we're at clan violence here. You've watched enough movies and TV shows in the modern world to know what we're talking about here. You kill a member of my family, I'll kill two or three of your family, you kill five of my family, I wipe out your village. Things are completely out of control. We get to the Mosaic period and we have that famous eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth first. This is not requiring that murderers be killed. It's limiting things, it's putting a limit on what can be exacted. For our purposes, we can talk about two different kinds of law, mandates and laws of limitation. And this might work. In New Hampshire, if you register a car, if you want to drive a car, you need to register it, you need a license plate. That's a mandate. The speed limit is a law of limitation. I can drive up to there. I don't have to actually drive the speed limit. Clearly, we know that the eye for an eye is this limitation. You can't do more than that. So it's taking a step back toward uh, what we saw in the Cain story. Not quite there yet. And the people who talk about eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, they only tend to use this when you're talking about the death penalty. I mean, if, if you're a drunk driver and you smash into my car, and my wife becomes blind and I become crippled, we don't think that your punishment should be, we're going to blind your wife and cripple you. So it doesn't work that way. Even our system doesn't work that way. I tried to be nice. We all know Mario Cuomo's comment. So you rape my wife, so that means I rape your wife. That's the way this works. I mean, it doesn't work that way. Our system doesn't work that way. So we've got the Cain story, where God does not permit retaliatory violence. We've got the craziness of the clan fights. We've got the attempt to move slightly back in the Mosaic period. And then we get to the New Testament. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You've heard it said, but I say to you. He specifically references that text of the Old Testament. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, and he goes all the way back to the beginning. He talks about returning good for evil, not evil for evil. In the Cain story, God says no retaliatory violence. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says no retaliatory violence. That's the scriptural position. When you look at the, uh, the Jewish scriptures, when you look at the teachings of Jesus as a whole, what we find is an esteem for the protection of human life, for mercy, and a rejection of vengeance. So the scripture. Tradition. What do we do in tradition? John Paul II, in that encyclical, he's aware of the traditional Catholic position on what do you do to punish people. Crime deserves punishment. So under what circumstances? And we talk about rehabilitation, we talk about deterrence, we talk about protection of society, and we talk about retribution. So, rehabilitation. The idea is this human person with this dignity, we want to give them the chance to repent. We want to give them the chance to convert. But if you kill them, they can't do that. We can do that with life. If you execute people, you cut that short. With respect to defense of society and deterrence, the Pope, the Catholic bishops, the members of the St. Anselm College Criminal Justice Department uh, all believe that there is no evidence that capital punishment is a deterrent. It just is not. Now, protection of society. The system mentioned this as well. Um, yeah, we need to protect society. The, the, the two examples usually used, the first one is amputation, so for the nurses in the crowd. Uh, so you have an infection in one of your limbs. Normally, we don't have a right to amputate a healthy part of our body. But if, in fact, we don't deal with this infection, it's going to kill us, and we have a right to amputate the body, that part of the body. But John Paul II says, well, in the modern world, we have medicine. So we can apply the medicine, read the life in prison. We can apply the medicine instead of amputating or killing the person. Well, what about self-defense? How about that? Uh, Church has always said, if someone is about to kill you, in the only way, last resort, the only way you can save your life is to kill them, you have a right to do that. Now, if someone is about to kill you and you've got a baseball bat, and you render them unconscious and tie them up, 
You just you can't walk over and shoot them then. They're, they're not an aggressor anymore. And so when you move this to the capital punishment argument, these criminals on death, they're no longer a threat to society. They're no longer aggressors. So the argument doesn't work. We can safely put people away for the rest of their life and not have them a threat to society. It doesn't work. Uh, the last one is retribution. Retribution is not vengeance. It's recognizing that when someone has committed a crime, when someone has willfully done something they shouldn't have to do, then there's an imbalance going on. And we need to redress that. So serious crime should be punished more seriously than uh, something that's not quite as serious. But you don't need to kill people to do that. It doesn't mandate the death penalty, and we shouldn't exact the death penalty. So the imposition of the death penalty under the conditions in contemporary American society, not justified. Not justified. If it was, it's just to say once upon a time, the situation today is such that we can safely put someone away from society, protect society, try and rehabilitate them without killing them. So that leaves us with teaching of the church, which sort of been doing that already. Uh, in, this has been, I don't think, a long time here. In 1974, the U.S. Catholic Conference, the American bishops, came out against the death penalty, and they've done so consistently ever since. Uh, when the U.S. Supreme Court reinstituted the death penalty in 1976, the Papal Commission on Justice and Peace opposed it. Uh, we're back to John Paul II again. He said, again, it's permissible only when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society. And today, such cases are very rare. They're practically non-existent. He said that in 95. When he was in the United States in St. Louis in 1999, in a homily, he said this. He called for the consensus to end the use of the death penalty, which he called cruel and unnecessary. And he also told us to take a look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a little longer, so I need to read this one, but it supports what I've been saying. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, If bloodless means are sufficient to defend human lives against an aggressor and to protect public order and the safety of persons, public authority must limit itself to such means, bloodless means, because they better correspond to the concrete <coughs> conditions of the common good and are more in conformity to the dignity of the human person. In other words, the conclusion is obvious. The imposition of the death penalty under the conditions of contemporary American society is not justified. The imposition of the death penalty in 21st century New Hampshire is not justified. Well, good evening. My name is Meredith Cook, and I'm the director of the Office of Public Policy of the Di Roman Catholic Diocese of Manchester, and I have the best job in the world. I advocate for the voice of Bishop Labashi and the Roman Catholic Church here in New Hampshire before the New Hampshire Legislature. We are poised to make history here in New Hampshire. I can tell you that after spending the afternoon at the State House. Um, 180 years ago, in 1834, Governor William Badger first asked the legislature to abolish the death penalty here in New Hampshire. And 180 years later, we sat at the State House today. And I started thinking as I was sitting here, that, boy, I could say we heard from different perspectives because this person who's in the room testified and this person who's in the room testified. And, that, and I, if I started trying to do it, I would miss somebody. Um, a lot of people who were at the State House today testified who are in this room right now. And um, your voice, what you did today, truly made a difference. Um, that hearing was... Um, one of the most compelling hearings I've ever attended. It was amazing. Um, we, the, for those of you who were not there, um, the room had to be moved because there were so many people who came out, um, and in particular, so many people who came out to support the bill. Um, there were very few people who came out to oppose the bill. It was um, the room where it was supposed to be held uh, was full, and then the line of people just waiting, not even to speak, but just to sign in to support the bill, went out the door, around the corner, down the hall. Um, it was amazing. Uh, people from all kinds of perspectives. Uh, people who support the bill because um, they're concerned about perspectives on innocence. Um, that We can't guarantee that we're going to, uh, even if you believe in the death penalty, um, that our system, our trials, are, uh, I come from a perspective where I'm an attorney, and I think our jury system is phenomenal. But even if we can't guarantee 
that we're going to be able to um, to execute the right person. Um, and over 140 people have been exonerated. Um, that's an error rate that's over 10 percent. Um, and there are from, there are a lot of industries where we would not accept error rates of over 10 percent. Um, there are people who come from perspectives, uh, there were murder victim family members, it was interesting because one of the reasons why there were concerns about holding, the hearing had to be moved to be representatives hall. And for those of you who have ever seen it on television, we have, <clears throat> we have 400 members of our representatives, of our House of Representatives in New Hampshire. And if you've seen the room, it's, it's huge with 400 people. Um, and so you have to stand at a microphone in the middle of, you know, of, a, of a, uh, a hallway, you know, an aisle that would be like this. And so for people who have to testify, if you're not used to speaking in public, you have to stand at a microphone in the middle of the aisle, the committee's further away from you. Um, and my, one of my concerns was sort of, you know, for murder victim family members, that would be really difficult. Um, you just stand at a microphone like that, it's, it's really not humane. I will tell you, I thought the murder victim family members today were far and away some of the most compelling speakers that we had today. Um, and you know what, I don't think any of them had notes. Um, I think that all of them spoke just truly from the heart and were um, just really just said what was on their hearts and their minds and uh, were the most, some of the most compelling speakers today. Um, we had our bipartisan group of sponsors. Um, there are 10 sponsors and um, this lead sponsor, Representative Cushing, announced today there are 107 co-sponsors for this bill, which is unheard of. Um, so, and we have a legislature of 400 members. Um, so, it is just um, a landslide of people who are, are looking to support this bill. We had people from a law enforcement perspective, um, former judges, uh, former attorneys general, uh, county attorneys, I mean, just a landslide of people who were interested um, in, in supporting this bill. And also people from the faith community. Uh, we had the a representative from the New Hampshire Council of Churches, we had uh, Bishop Labashi, Bishop Hirschfeld from the Episcopal Diocese, um, a representative um, who spoke, uh, we had actually more than one um, person who spoke in terms of a faith perspective, that, um, that if you are, uh, from a pro-life perspective, that having a continuous ethic, that if you are pro-life, you are pro-life, um, that if you, if you believe that uh, in the, uh, if you believe in human dignity, that even those who commit great crimes um, should not be sentenced to death. Um, the one other story that we heard um, that I've, and sometimes not necessarily on the floor of the house, but certainly in the hallways, um, and the voice that's been making a big difference is that of John Breckenridge, and you'll hear him tell it himself, um, but, if, uh, but I have been hearing it certainly very much in the hallways of the House. Um, it was up earlier this week, and um, everyone is talking about him. Um, I've already had a chance to tell him, but, uh, but, it's, um, but it's certainly a compelling story when, um, when someone can share a faith story um, as well as he has shared it. And so, for those of you who support repeal, um, you know, what makes, if you don't support repeal, then I don't want you contacting your legislator at all. <laughs> but for those of you who support repeal, <laughs> you know, what makes a difference? Um, what makes a difference in terms of talking to your legislators? I know a lot of times people will say, um, you know, what, why bother? Um, I've got these legislators, these elected officials, they've already made up their mind. What makes a difference? Um, I can tell you after talking to some legislators, they are there are some who truly have not made up their mind, um, and what they want to hear is they want to hear from their constituents. Um, I, I know that from talking to people, they want to know exactly what their constituents think. Um, so people say, well, you know, I'll drop them an email, or you know, maybe if I do anything, that's what I'll do. Um, I can tell you from my experience, there's a couple of different things. Now one, first of all, let me reiterate, so we have 400 members of our house, we have 24 senators, um, so for that, when you talk about those 400 members of your house, they represent almost, you know, it's about 3,000 people. So they don't live far from you. And so just remember that. They, you know, they know, you may know who they are, keep that in mind. Um, they do listen. And so, and keep in mind, today, you know, today, this hearing, it was a big deal, but it's just the first step. Um, this was the hearing in the house. We'll still have to have the executive session, we have executive session in the, of this committee. We have to go to the House floor, we still have to have a hearing in the Senate, we still have to, so there's still a lot to do. So being in touch with your legislators is truly important. Um, 
I want to give you kind of a hierarchy. The most, the best thing that you can do, the most effective thing you can do, is to meet with your legislator. Meeting with your legislator one on one, that contact, most effective. Um, having a phone call with your legislator also right up there. Why? Because you can have because it's interactive. You can you can go back and forth. You can listen. You can hear what your legislator has to say so that when you tell your arguments in terms of why you support the death penalty, you can hear it back in terms of well, if the legislator says, well, you know, this is what I'm thinking. Okay, well, then that gives you some points in terms of being able to work back and forth. Um, email, why is email ineffective? Right now, there were over 700 bills introduced in the legislature. They are getting far too many emails. Um, and some of our legislators, not too savvy in terms of technology. Um, and so, not checking their email, um, and so they'll just, they just get deleted. So, it, far better to do that. Um, but I also would put in terms of something that is effective that we're hearing from a lot of the legislators, personal notes, um, dropping a note, um, especially if you see that your legislator is one of the sponsors, especially one of the lead sponsors, um, dropping them a note thanking them. Legislators earn $200 for every two-year session. They get paid $100 a year. And if you saw what their weeks look like this week, that is not nearly enough money for what, you know, what people are putting in. Um, dropping them a note to thank them uh, would be well, it would be a phenomenal idea. Um, <coughs> dropping them a note to tell them you'd like them to you know, think about what they want to do on this bill. Um, we've had a number of legislators recently who said that when anybody right now in this day and age when everybody's emailing, if somebody actually takes the time to drop a handwritten note, they pay attention to that. Um, and what do you say? What's the content? Share a story. If you have your own personal story in terms of why you support repeal of the death penalty, that is the most effective thing that you can do. Keep it short, keep it succinct, um, but share your story. If you do not have your own story, plagiarize. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and what do I mean by that? Share someone else's story. Um, talk about how you came to this session tonight. You heard Sister Helen. It moved you and you want to share that. You came tonight. You heard John Breckenridge. It moved you. Share that story. Um, because that is truly, sharing a story is what truly makes the difference. And so with that, I want you to hear John Breckenridge's story. My story is just one really of change and how it's possible to change. For me, um, I was a psych major here. I graduated. I went to work for Manchester Mental Health as a social worker. Um, typical St. A's kid, very naive, gonna go change the world. You know, I love people, I love society. Here we go. Uh, two years later, I left that job. I became a police officer in Manchester. Uh, I was 80. And during that time, you go from the ideals taught at St. Anne's home to you really see the worst in people. You go to rape, shooting, stabbings. You see the greed, the selfishness. Um, you go from really liking people and you just get this anger inside. For me personally, it's a weakness on my part. I became very hateful. There's a reason you get out of that job at 45 or 20 years in because it will just eat you up. I really don't want to talk about any of the details of that case. All I'm going to say is that uh, it all led up to 2006. Uh, my partner was murdered in front of me. Um, after that happened, um, the anger I had, very naturally, I think, spilled out to, I wanted to see his killer die. I was mad at myself I had killed him that night. I really wish I had. Um, there was a hearing four or five years ago on the committee to study the death penalty. And I testified uh, to the committee to keep it. I was pissed, excuse my French. Um, I wanted to see this guy pay, and that's the way it was going to be. Uh, this time I had been raised Catholic. I would move very far from the church, well, as far as possible. Uh, didn't really mean to, it just kind of happened all the time. Um, during this time, I, uh, my family was falling apart. I was making poor decisions. I was living at home, I was drinking heavily. It was just a downward spiral that kept going. Um, eventually, I reached the point of 
I realized the decisions I were making, well, none of them were positive, none of them were helping out. I was hurting people all around me. I retired from police work and I came here in 2010, same year for all you students, classmates. Um, I came here and the anger kind of dropped. It started to. It took a little while. But I went from seeing the worst in people to we started seeing decent people that treat each other well. Uh, I started talking to some of the monks. I remember the students, a lot of them are still here. I started to not be suspicious of crowds. I started to be comfortable with people. It was definitely a big change. I used to work the midnight shift, and the big thing was I would actually go to church once in a while. I would start to pray. Uh, got my rosary up, started using that again. Uh, no holy roller, I just started reconnecting. That's all. Uh, I started going to church again. I attended a Bible study group here and there. And like I said, it's all about change. It's not change that any of us can do. It's change to say, look, the way I'm making decisions, I'm full of anger, I'm full of hate, I'm hurting everybody around me. The change was to say, I need to say, it's not what I want to do. Uh, I just ask God, please help me out. If you let me know what you want me to do, I'll try. And that was it. He was able to change me. I started to realize that all this anger, all this wanting to kill that person was as a result of the hate. And when I started letting go of that, I started looking more deeply into what the church taught. And as they spelled it out much better than I ever could. You know, it's not... I explain it. It's more when you let go of the anger and you start to realize that uh, it's just not worth it. It just it, it ate me up, it ate my family up. I hurt a lot of people. And I was lucky to get that together. But the change wasn't me. It was going back to the church and doing that. I really have nothing else that you guys covered the theology I guess that's about it. I just wanted to say um, thank you and that I was at the hearing today and heard all the testimonies. And there were about four or five people that spoke that said that they had once supported the death penalty and now they opposed it. And I noticed no one went the other way. No one said, I opposed the death penalty, and now all of a sudden, I'm angry and I'm for it. Uh, for whatever that's worth. Right. Thank you all. But, John, wow. Um, a friend just said, read the story before John speaks. And I read the story in the parable, and it's an amazing story. I work on Lake Avenue. And every day I'm working, Mondays and Thursdays, I pass that alleyway and I've been praying and all this time I thought I was praying for Michael. Now I know who I've been praying for. I, I guess I wanted to share something. Um, you talked about the mistake that you had made about not going to the uh, family of the victims and at the uh, hearing today as I was leaving, one of the few people that was testifying against the bill was the deputy chief of the Manchester Police Department, I forget his name. Um, I went up to him and said, thank you for your service, thank you for your testimony. I'm opposed to the death penalty, but I wanted to share with you and your colleagues and the Briggs family for whom he was speaking in his testimony um, my sorrow over your loss. And he shook my hand and said thank you and said it meant a lot to him. And I think as we move forward, we should remember that a lot of the people that are testifying against repealing the death penalty are hurting. And that we need to um, share their pain and, and, and be with compassion. My name is Tom Hamlin, and I was at the hearing uh, today, too, and I'm very moved by various um, testimonies that people made. Uh, one thing that wasn't spoken about, which I'd like to bring up, is that um, the families of the uh, convicted murderers, uh, uh, we haven't spoken about the suffering that they go through. Uh, those who have gone to um, the execution of uh, family members, um, often are very um, upset about 
what has happened to their family and to their relative. And I think that um, uh, the, the, um, the death penalty hurts um, those who um, uh, execute people uh, and uh, the, those who have um, been hurt by um, the, the convicted uh, murderers as well and also their families. So let's remember them as well. I guess the question that I have is, we realize, I think, as your story so aptly says, it's a process. And people are at many different places in a process. And as I've become uh, more aware through, you know, I get the diocesan email, I get the email that the gentleman over there is, but you speak to people who say, how, you know, how, can, how can you want to get rid of it? It's, that's an important, it's an important thing I, to, to have. And I guess what I'd like is, what do you think is a good way to respond to that? Um, I mean, do you have any real good suggestion as to kind of what's, where's a place to insert in a positive way, you know, than saying, you're crazy, you know? Yeah, that usually doesn't yeah, that does, that doesn't, yeah, just you're crazy. That. No, you're crazy. Okay, that's the end of that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, you know, I, when I stepped out of the execution chamber after watching for the first time a man be killed, I knew what I had to do. I mean, it's a way the mission in life was given to me to go and tell the story because people never get close to the death penalty. The, you know, if you ever do the execution in this state, it's going to be a secret ritual. There's going to be a few people chosen. You'll read about it after you hear about it. But I was there. And I have found in talking to the American people that most people have not thought deeply about it. And because they, because people are so horrified at crime, at the innocence of people, like this policeman in the line of duty is shot down and killed. And you're so angry at that, that people say, well, we got to have the death penalty. So there's a certain amount of feeling, an ethical kind of feeling of responsibility that people who do these terrible crimes don't deserve to live. That person's dead. They deserve to die for what they did. They also do not have any information. So if anybody ever says to me, we got to have the death penalty, and I'll just say to them, well, just tell me, why, why do you think that? Give me some reasons why you think we got to have it. And sometimes when I'm giving talks to schools or colleges like in Texas, I uh, usually start the talk with, we got to have the death penalty. and Because I know all arguments now because I've talked to so many people. we got to have it because those people don't deserve to live. If you were the victim's family, somebody killed your daughter, your child, would you want to see that person die? You know, all the questions. It'll deter crime. What could deter crime better than self-preservation? I might get killed myself, so that'll keep me from killing a person or maybe killing the witnesses. All these things that people think and assumptions that they make that we now know don't work and aren't true. And so I'll start with people anywhere. I'll just say, tell me, just give me your reason. Give me the best reasons you got for why you think we got to have it. And, and you're so right about it being a process, because it's just one conversation, and then out of all, maybe they give me four reasons, I'll say, did you ever think about this maybe? Or what I've experienced is maybe this. You know what, um, and if people can read, if they can read something so that they can get information, and when you're reading, you're not debating, and it gives you a chance to change your mind. But to know that it's a process, this is one conversation. But people who are coming out of pain, who said that, um, yeah, that, you know, all the police that worked with, uh, with Officer Briggs, they're in pain. Their brother was killed. And when people are in pain, we need to let them express their pain. And the best thing we can say is, I'm so, so sorry for your loss. I'm outraged that that, and that man was killed. And that's all. That's all we can do then. 
is just staying with them in their pain. And if they get love and support, they're going to make their way. But arguments with them are never, and never arguing about the issue. When we did form a murder victim support group in New Orleans, ground rule, we're not trying to change anybody's idea on the death penalty by this group. This families, all these people who have lost people to murder need love, support, listening, understanding, because they go through terrible stuff. They lose their job, they start drinking, they start slapping their, their family around, they're in anger. All kinds of stuff happen to people who've been traumatized. And we need to be with them in that. Pope Francis is teaching us something about go be with people. It's an encounter. Just be with them, accompany them. We don't have to change them. Good evening. My name is Representative Melanie Levake. I'm one of the co-sponsors of this. Yeah. I'm Penny, who is the key sponsor. And several others. I just wanted to, first of all, thank the panel so much. I feel like I just got a reinforcement of everything that we're doing and in education, and I appreciate you sharing your views. As a representative, I just wanted to say to all of you, send the email tonight, because we all have emails, and when you send your email, please put the city that you live in, because the reps will read it if they know that you're their voter. So that's really very important. And you can also send a letter as well to back it up, but email is instant. Most of us are on it. And thank you all very much. Um, I just want to say briefly to the students here tonight, uh, what is the obvious? Uh, John has already said that he is a graduate of St. Anselm. Meredith Cook did not identify herself, but she's also a graduate. And really what I want to say as a teacher is Professor Sweetman, myself, and Professor McKenna, Father Anselm and the rest of us, we can teach you some things out of books. You'll forget most of it. We understand that. Uh, the eloquence of their example, the eloquence of Meredith's courage and John's courage, may be the best lesson you learn this semester, wherever you stand on this issue. That's what we want you to aspire to. So thank you to both of you as graduates. Well, I, I just wanted to point out um, the conundrum that I deal with all the time is the contrast between Sister Helen's message uh, that we don't want to convince anyone, yet there are a few senators that we very much want to convince. And I think that for anyone moved by faith in this, that it is a conundrum, that it, it is a useful at times to be uh, political. You know, you've got to be political, but if you aren't centered, you'll lose. I just want to say, when it comes to representatives and legislators, we need to talk to them. You better believe it. Because we need to say, I just want to share with you what, you know, what I've come to see in this and why I want you to be on the side of life uh, for in this. I mean, we're an outright, really persuasive conversation then. I was addressing more, whereas you're talking to just someone who's like a fellow citizen is just start, and you can tell where they are, is they're all for the death penalty and where do we begin. With legislators, you gotta really talk to them about what you think and say it to them, and it helps them. They need that. You know, but at the same time, I think it's still the way, the messaging and the way you do it, because um, people are not convinced by necessarily, um, by debate, by, you know, the, we've, um, we go through this all the time with people where we're saying, you know, where we have um, very good-hearted people of goodwill who get very passionate on any issue, and once they get started and they get rolling, they just start going. And um, and I've never been convinced by someone who came up and started screaming and yelling at me. And so you know, so it's, how, it's that messaging and how you do it. So debating doesn't necessarily do it, but that going in, presenting the information, listening, um, understanding. So what's the concern on the other side? Is it because my senator is really concerned? Okay, I'm, I'm close and I'm on the fence, but I'm concerned that some crimes are just too heinous. Okay, which ones? 
and which, where are you? Is it because of, is it because of law enforcement? Is it because of something else? Okay, because then I can come back and I can be talking to the New Hampshire Coalition against the death penalty, and I can be matching up somebody who's former law enforcement to be talking to that senator. Um, so that I could be getting the right people to talk with the right messages. So I think that's the political piece of it. I think it's making sure that um, we get the right people with the right messages to talk to the right. But but again, it's, it's constituents, constituents, constituents um, conveying that message. Again, if we could just thank our uh, distinguished panel for being with us.